School Board of Directors for Montpelier Westbury School District. Um, two agenda item changes, one addition and one change. Um, Lisa Frost has asked to have her name put forth for Clark, so I think we can, there seem to be some problems around that. So uh, we can, I think, formally nominate vote on her candidacy for clerk, so we can have a clerk and we can back and forth. Okay. Um, let's, wait, let's have a couple first order. Okay. Um, and the second is, at the board governance discussion, uh, the current agenda says to review and approve the negotiations committee charge. Uh, we are going to do the finance committee instead of the negotiations committee. Uh, we'll do the negotiations committee. So let's do public comment first, which will be quick, because it's right here. Um, so then what do we do is the first Okay. All second. Any discussion? Okay. Can we review quickly the duties of the clerk? Uh, we know we have to have one. I will work with Lisa to uh, formalize those. At the last meeting, we discussed that the remainder duty is to make sure every meeting we have is posted. Yes, so. In the appropriate the, place. So, the, to make sure we meet the posting requirements yeah. and minutes that are taken. Yeah. That yeah. she does not take them, she just makes sure they're taken? Exactly. Uh, Okay, that's it. Yeah, most of the duties, you know, Heather basically does. Yeah, because we have a professional, right? Now. Yeah. And I think we said this time around, it was, whoever was willing to step up to the position was going to be willing to explore options for how this is done and to ensure that we're doing things correctly and got it just, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that work, Lisa and I have kind of shown that is things like maybe increasing visibility of questions on the forum and, um, you know, Facebook pages and that's how they just pages so people have more channels where they're seeing the minutes and so uh, but I'll I'll work with those back to So um, any further discussion? Vote to nominate or to appoint Lisa as Hi. Hi. Any opposed? Great. Um, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Or will you approve the consent agenda? Uh, any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And then, that's what we're going to Yeah, I um, just realized that we don't have a projection ability here, and I didn't think about that early enough. Um, so um, I was going to show you all something, but I'll talk about it. I'll share it with everybody. Uh, we can certainly post it on the public as well. So one of our fo focuses this year, um, in the beginning of the year, is building a district-wide collaborative culture, which I've spoken to you all before. So I wanted to share with you some steps that we've taken thus far um, in doing that. Our per every first month of the month, I've been given this gift of a district-wide uh, staff meeting that is unique. We, we don't get that very often, and we have a small enough system that we can do that. So um, we have everybody come to the high school, and in the past, they've done book discussions and protocols around that and things like that. We're taking a different take on it. We had our first one a couple months, or a couple last month, and we timelined our entire history of it as educators. So across all the walls in the high school, using post-its and things, people, everybody in our district put up when they started working for Mount Pitt or Roxbury Public Schools. Um, everybody in the district started, talked about their past history as to why they became educators, big moments in their life, the students that wanted them, made them become educators, things that really touched them, things that frustrated them. Um, other questions were, what class was that class that you just remember for whatever reason and why? What was that student, particular moments in your teaching career? Um, so it was pretty phenomenal. 
it was a while logistics weren't great, the the story that the post-its told was goosebump, you know, goosebump reasonable. So it was it was fantastic. There were some really funny post-its. Um, there were some really uh, touching post-its that were about um, just coming into their identity, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you know, I get some, you can see some pictures of this. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that that kind of thing has happened. Um, and it looks kind of like this. We have, some, we have all of these now. You see, this is the 2018 and things like dabbing. And um, one of my favorite ones in, in 2018, I learned I hate Fortnite. <laughs> and, and, and some funny ones that were that were great. Um, the Black Lives Matter flag being raised was was a theme that popped out. Um, it was interesting because I learned a lot around Heather, when I was planning this particular logistics. Heather wasn't there for two days, who was my lifeline to things like this, and so I didn't realize how many. I didn't know when educators were hired and when they weren't. Um, so I made an assumption that in the 90s, 80s, and 90s, a lot of people would have been hired. Ah, I was way off. <laughs> so, so that's part of our logistical challenges because the most people you can see were hired between 2010 and 2018 just from that visual of the post-its right there. Um, so that was, it was just fascinating. So we put this on a timeline, we, we put them by theme, um, and if you really look up close, you can see some really touching pieces here. Um, and, and I think it was pretty great for the staff in general. This was one of my favorites. Um, bigger was the 1960s to 69. Um, and, sorry, I can't post it, but it talks about Woodstock and JFK, and it's like a history class right here on the 60s, and the teachers who put these events up and talked about how they influenced them as educators was a fascinating conversation. And then what was even more fascinating was when the young bucks like me came behind them and started talking about that as well. Um, that was really something, you know, and talking about uh, what grade you were in when the Challenger explosion happened and how that influenced you later in life. And if you were in a grade or if you were teaching during that time, which we still have a few. So it was just a fascinating conversation, brought people together. Um, and that's how we started this work around collaborative culture, what our influences as, as educators, because I think that's really important to celebrate our history. So this learning focus is really quick today. I just want to share that with you. I'm sorry that I can't project it here, um, but I just thought you might find that interesting how we're starting that. Our next step with this is to look at our current realities around the evidence of where we are in student learning um, and have some frank conversations about that. And then the next step after that is where do we want to go all together as a step. So I just wanted to share that with you as, as first steps in how we're building this collaborative culture. Did you say it was monthly that you had this? Yeah. Okay. Yep, first Monday of every, every month. Can you see people show up? They have to, they have to sign in. There are a few that won't and didn't, and we'll we follow up with them yeah. very quickly. So, yes, part of their contracted hours. Great. Right. Yep. Um, some other things are next month in November, our student reps are starting with us, Emma, Harper, and Hope Trero, who are very excited to join us, the lovely, um, Articulate young women that I think are going to be a really good bonus to the to the board. And then they're just working in the same way. I'm not sure how they were determined. Um, Mike McCrae put those names forward to us. So, do you know how they were chosen? I'm not sure they were chosen. The, the, the student council. I know that they in the past have had had voting. But I don't know. Right. Right. So that's oh, so yeah. I, I don't know if they're part of that. We can ask Mike to get started. One thing we haven't been real great at in the past few years is really engaging them. Mm -hmm. They sit, they listen, they go home. They don't, uh, they don't complain, but they don't really get invited to be equals in the discussion. Um, and I've actually taken them all to lunch at one time or another and had discussions with them about how we Likewise, even though they sit, they also don't like it when you suddenly remember that they're there and somebody says, oh, so what do you think? Yeah. How about something 
they have no background on or haven't been studied. And so I think we have to think first. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're actually trying to set up a meeting with open MI prior to the session. Uh, so we can start to ask them how we want to do it. And I'm new to this board having student representation, but the new board has much more in terms of committee capacity than the old one. Um, so that might be a better opportunity to really get the students engaged in maybe a smaller, more safe environment. Mm -hmm. I've already met with them once. Um, they're very, I, I asked them, I said, how do you want to go out? Do you want to do kind of a student thing and then leave? Do you want to stay for the whole board? And they said, I want to stay for the whole board game. I want, I want it all. So we um, talked about what I've been talking about over the past about the reporting on something that's happening in school, whatever. And they were interested in part of what we talked about is even though there are high school students, you know, one of them said, oh, I'll go to the middle school. And we were talking about that one, about how they're in the elementary school. So I thought that was good. Yeah, I have talked about that. Um, how do they get perspectives and kind of reports from student um, populations that they don't want to, you know, that they aren't part of. So they, they have it on their minds. I think these two are going to take it and fly. We'll just need some guidance. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Well, and a simple thing, too, I'm not sure we did this in the past, but just providing them the agenda and checking in before the meeting and yep. saying, are there items here where you really want to say something? Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what you said about um, being surprised when we finally asked them, I think that leads to you know, them not feeling empowered, right? Because how could they prepare if they're never asked? And yeah, we'll get them ready. Yeah, yeah. but I think, I think we can do that as a group, too, by just regularly expecting them to be participating, and then they'll, they'll be prepared because they'll realize they're going to get called on in a minute for an opinion, you know, or whatever. And knowing these ladies, I don't think they'll have problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do they have, do the student reps have a formal role on the board? They might imagine they will be giving some reports from the student perspective of what's happening, the big items that are happening, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have to really think about how we can. I don't think it's fine. But they have an hour. Yeah. Also, they have concerns that if I go up to the student council, they grant to you yeah. if they don't want to. I mean, what do I want to do to define a school report? That's what I'm wondering then. Mm -hmm. the, the yeah, I can get Liam. An interesting thought in one of the discussion we had about is really the fear about representing everybody if you're a, an adult board member. So if you're asked to sit down as a student board member, are you giving just your opinion? Or have you talked to some people about it? Are you expressing an opinion to you know, as a representative of the student? Um, the innovation reading and discussion, I did not like plan any formal protocols or anything. I'm just curious as to what popped out at you all. Um, usually when, we, when I do a non-formal you know, protocol, what popped, what made you think, what questions, what, can, what challenges could you make? So my wife saw that I was reading that, and she's read the book, and she sent me all of these additional materials. <laughs> <laughs> you additional homework. <laughs>
So, I, so the you know the process of thinking behind an essay and how it's transferable. Not that it's not relevant, but I mean those are the types of skills like being able to like are you teaching an essay or a blog post? Are you teaching people how to think critically, how to present Part arguments thought, yeah. persuasively, how to back them up with evidence? You know how to compel people with their arguments, etc. I think what I don't want to put words in Carlos's mouth, but I think what he would say is that um, yes, and the medium that we tech we teach those things through is essay and only essay. And in this day and age knowing how to write an effective blog post quickly, you know, like getting those ideas across quickly um, may have a different way to get at students than the traditional essay. I don't think he'd say it's an either or. That's, yeah. what, that's what I think is great. It's, that's what I was going to Yeah. I like the emphasis on the different mediums by which information can be purveyed, but what I liked even more than that was uh, the emphasis that these mediums aren't the ends in and of themselves, that they're the means to get to these other ends. Uh, I thought that was an important message. Yeah. I think the, kind of along the theme that Jim was pointing out, the almost cliche comment that they use that we need to prepare kids for jobs that don't yet exist. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how it's always been. It's like, you know, we're not predicting what technology is going to be like. We have to make sure that they know how to use this software program. It's really along the same thing as Jim is pointing out. You know, we need to make sure the kids have the skills that allow them to teach themselves how to continue growing on their own. And it's really it's those, I mean, teach the soft parents. skills yeah. that yeah, are really important. It doesn't matter if it's, again, 1990, 1980, whatever. You're still being taught mm -hmm. the skills to allow you to move forward and independently. But those are the, those are, that's not very going back very far in history or the history of schools. And I think that in some ways we, are, we don't even operate our schools like 1980. We operate them like 1900 in a sense, in the sense that they're, they're designed for a much, and I don't, I don't mean fully, but we're still coming out of a period of designing for the industrial kind of path. And so we have a, we have a much slower rate of technology change that we're expecting. And what we need to expect in the future is much, is continual speed, and so, I don't know, I mean, I think that that is a true statement, it is a cliche, <laughs> it is a true statement, and I don't know that it's true in the way that at least I was educated, no one ever thought that way when I was being educated, we were being educated for the jobs that have always existed, jobs that existed for my teacher's generation at that point. I don't remember ever being taught anything about, you're going to need to adapt, <laughs> that was never a part of our education. And I don't think it's now either. It's not now either? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But there would have been people in your cohort, in your generation, that would have been taught in the framework that you're describing, but still came up with new designs for instruments, or came up with not necessarily the paradigms. Part of education. education. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just no, I don't know. I mean, I think that right, the creators, mm -hmm. the innovators, in many ways, have had to always buck everything. Right? They would have been taught how to do that. To be liberated, right? Right. They've been, they've had to choose to be liberated against expectations in a yep. sense. And I think that's very much the reality still mm -hmm. now. If you're looking at the millennial generation and the amount of side hustles and mm -hmm. the way people are making a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know, it's bucking trends, it's bucking mm -hmm. expectations. He said, so we saw, I told you all, we saw him in a conference, and one of the stories that's sticking with me right now is a student who was out in California, and her dream was to go to UCLA or some school like that, and she had pretty average grades, and, um, you know, on paper, she, well, she didn't get in. She got waitlisted. So she called up the, uh, the, the people making the decisions, the admissions office, and, and just said, my name is this, you put me on the, on the waitlist, Google me right now. And so they Googled her. This girl had created, like she had millions of followers on her YouTube channel and, and showed so much knowledge and growth and initiative as an 18 year old that they immediately said, you're in <laughs> from her, from just Googling her, right? So, and, and she did that in spite of school. 
you know, because her school record did not indicate that she was this famous YouTuber um, to, to millions of people in her generation. Her school couldn't integrate that. Right. 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 You know, I just read this other article about um, college debt and the amount of people that are in their 30s or in that age range that are paying huge sums of money for their college debt and don't have a job because you know they went to a little large school or they didn't or they were got a job and didn't and I think it's our job to help people be innovative. Some of the people with the most money in the world don't have a college degree. Mm -hmm. They were innovative thinkers and they didn't need one. I'm not suggesting no one go to college. I'm just saying we need to rethink that too. On, on a total different note, though, so I, I, I generally agreed and, and, and valued the perspectives in, in the, the body of this, but I thought the beginning of this change almost never fails because it's too early. It almost always fails because it's too late. I, I, because it, it was on the front of this, I thought about it. I was on, I was on the plane when I first picked this up, and then um, it's just kind of been in my face on the table every morning. <laughs> Major <laughs> and, way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and that quote, which isn't his quote, he, he's grabbing it from this set going, I don't know who that is. But I, I do think that there's, a, I, I was thinking about that, and I don't know how accurate that particular statement is. Like, take for example. It's, it's totally inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. Yeah, totally. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I can think particularly with regard to uh, new technology, particularly information technology, like at the state level. I, like, uh, you know, the, the health benefit exchange was, Vermont was out front trying to implement this uh, state-of-the-art um, health insurance exchange. And it, it kind of had to do that from a policy perspective to maintain its programs for lower and middle income working people. Um, but because we were out front on the, the front end of that technology, uh, we, you know, we squandered a lot of, or not we, but the state of Vermont squandered quite a, quite a bit of taxpayer dollars during that effort, and so did other states that were out front on that. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, and at the tax department where I work, there were some early IT systems that really fell flat on their face and were horrible and ineffective. And the new IT system that we have, it works really well because it's been developed over 10 years, and there were 10, 15 other states ahead of us who worked out those growing pains and were able to enjoy uh, those the effects of that. And then I think of like social media, like MySpace and the earlier versions of, of social media falling flat on their face. But what are you advocating for? I'm, 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 just, I'm not advocating for that. I do think though sometimes it's, it, it, you know, I, I think with regard to education and our approach to education, we should be thinking innovatively and pretty much everything you said in here, I, I generally agree with. Um, but when it comes to some some more administrative or technological leaps. Um, I think it's all right from time to time to say, hey, has any other state done this or has, have any other districts done this? Yeah. And if they have, learn, learn from what they've done well. And, well and other than that, I mean, it's just teaching people to be innovators and, and the skills behind that because there's, it's a different skill set, but you know, kind of going to like the essay versus blog, who knows if blogs are going to be a thing in 10 years. Um, but, you know, I think kind of going back, you know, several decades, you know, education could be taught a couple skills and those could get you through life. Now your skill is really the ability to enter, enter and be enterprising in new environments constantly. And do our teachers do that themselves? Yeah, that's one of his yeah. his sticks. Is, yes. is do, do do our teachers put them in a position, put themselves in a position where they have to feel that uncomfortableness yeah. and learn it themselves? You know, yeah. um, and some of the quotes that he said, he was like, "Kids aren't better at technology than adults are. They just push more buttons." Like, we're worried we're going to mess up, yeah. right? So we don't push the buttons. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They just keep pushing buttons until they figure it out. And then another one, he he said something around it. If you're not able and able and facile to figure out social media type things in this day and age, regardless of whether they're new or old, you are now illiterate. Um, and, and so do our teachers know that platform and that medium 
um, and if they shy away from it immediately, they're they're becoming unable to speak to our kids in, in a different way. So it's it's something that we really have to start thinking about. Anyway, thank you for that. We're gonna yeah, come up with a couple of subjects. Always, if anybody's interested in the whole book, let me know. I got it. We got a few copies of it. You're more than welcome to it. Andrew has it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, superintendent report, just some little things to push out. Fall festival success, thank you to the community. That was a miserable day um, and very cold in the dump booth. Right, Jen? Yeah. How many times your kids dunk you? Um, one time we probably spent a few months. But a bunch of little kids that just come up and... <laughs> that was fun, right? Yeah, water <laughs> cold. Huh? It was rich cold. Air and water both. No, I didn't do it, but I was in the... <laughs> the board was cold. It was definitely hard to contain the shaking. <laughs> but yeah, thank you to the community for supporting our schools and for the parents who put that up. Um, that was pretty impressive. I've been doing fire and police safety walkthroughs in all the buildings. Um, I still have to do the high school, but I've gone through here at Roxbury with the fire chief and um, police and at Union and at the middle school to make sure our buildings are all safe for kids. How are we doing? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. We have some changes, some just cleaning things up that need to happen, um, particularly from the fire perspective. Things out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are all surprises too. So, oh, that was just put there today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're developing a new procedure for volunteers. Heather's been working very hard on that with a leveling system for volunteers. I know, particularly at UAS, that's been a big shift for folks and we are working to clean that up. Um, some information was given out probably before we were ready for it to go out, and we're working on those communication structures as well. Could I ask just in general, what does a volunteer procedure look like now? Yeah. Um, I've been asked a little bit about it in the past few weeks, actually the fall yep. festival, that question came up several times. We're actually modeling ours after um, Central Vermont, the new school district, um, which would be the Northfield school district that has three different levels of volunteers. Um, so level one, you're serving on an interview committee. You don't come in contact with students, um, sure. that kind of thing. Working at the book fair, kind of thing, where it's very limited with parents around and everything like that, um, which has no background check required whatsoever. Level two being that you're in contact with students. So um, you, but you're never alone with students in any way, shape, or form. So it might be volunteering in a classroom, um, that kind of thing, working in the office, doing, putting books away for the librarian. Um, that would require the uh, Vermont online check that we do very quickly. Heather does it very quickly through our office. Um, and then level three would be that you, you may have the opportunity to be alone with kids, which is the full background check with fingerprinting. Okay. Um, so a chaperone who has a group of children by themselves at a farm would be an example. So if you're a level two volunteer, um, so the question that came up with the Falls Festival from several um, residents, parents, was if I was a legal citizen and my student was in the building, was it a child, and I wanted to accompany them, let's say, on like a field trip or something, um, would I be able to do that with the back, with the, I'm not sure what the Vermont background check would be. Um, if you're an illegal citizen, not here legally, you should put in a different way. Show up in the blank. You wouldn't right. show up in the system at all. So you wouldn't be able to pass your background check to be able to accompany them. You would? Which? Well, oh, the company or? You know, it's not name, date of birth, it's name, it's social security number? It might, it might well have a social name, security number. It's name, date of birth, and last four of your social security. And if it's a, if they say no match, what do they do? They say the response. How does it work? If, if, if the, no, record, no record found. No record found is what it would show. So you wouldn't, you'd be okay. you wouldn't be permitted then? Yeah. Okay. Um, unless you were on record as being, they're trying to find you. Sure. <laughs> then you'd have a violation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's probably. Vermont check too. It's just Vermont. That's a, it's yes. Vermont, so it's not an FBI. No fingerprints. Right. right. Okay. I, I don't know how fast that goes or how onerous that is, but I, I mean, I assume you all know there's going to be a chilling effect on volunteerism on that level too. But that's going to create a problem for a lot of. Um, it might create a problem for finding resources for teachers on trips, and it's definitely going to cause a problem for some folks just not volunteering. And so, just to be clear, that level three that you're talking about, trips and things, no, two. 
Level two is in traps. Level two is. So any trip, regardless of the intensity of contact, would be a three. If they are alone with children. Yeah. Well, I'm not talking about alone with. I'm talking about not alone with. Yeah. Like you know, like last year I went on a hike with my, with one of the two years ago I went on a hike with one of the teachers up to Elmore, and there were, you know, me and and two other parents, and Ms. Pierce and. 15 kids or 18 kids, mm -hmm. and so we all kept in visual with each other. Yeah. That's different than if you go to the city and I give you five kids and say, you're off on your own. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which I just did in Boston, right? Yeah. So that's, that would be a level three. Yeah. But a level which we're legally would... required to. Sure. Yeah. I don't think level three is going to going to have any issues for folks. I think it's a level two that has to be finesse to make sure that the, the district's needs are met, but also that we don't. Um, create barriers to, to community involvement in the schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we need to be really careful not to overreact, is what I'm saying. Yeah. What's the main barrier that you see? I think that folks will be like, I don't want to go through any background checks. And I don't understand why I have to. I'm never alone with a child. Uh, there's always a teacher around. Um, you know, what's the deal? That mainly, I'm mean, going to be honest, that, that mainly goes to the sex offenders um, check. With Vermont, I mean, that, those, that's what we're looking for. If, if a, what were some of the cases that we've seen, like some of the hits? DUI. DUI, or you know, that doesn't. In, you're not driving kids around. You're not like that's. There's a piece of it that's a, that's my responsibility to say, yeah, okay, you know, like that has nothing to do with what you're going to be doing with children. Right. It's more of the, I'm, what I look for is for things that could harm kids. I think it's wholly ineffective, number one, because it doesn't, it only looks at Vermont. The evidence shows that it doesn't really do that much. It doesn't really help. And the second thing is that it's, it absolutely chills. So if it's a DUI, if you say, if you tell me I'm not interested in your DUI, it doesn't matter. If I have a DUI, I'm not going to volunteer because I don't want to take a chance. I just think it's a real mistake to be doing background checks on parents unless you have to. And I don't think we have to on level two unless you can show me otherwise. I don't think it adds to the safety at all. Okay, thanks for your feedback. Tenants report this year, this week differently. I took the entry and plan to have an update on the entry plan, so that's why it looks differently. Um, just with what the principals added in, and then um, with my comments so thus far on the entry plan. So free to answer any questions anybody might have. Thought it was a great report. Told me a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's going to be a clarifying question. The curriculum, assessment, curriculum and assessment section of the report, you said that there was a high level of interest for restorative practices yeah. among the faculty. Could you just generally describe what restorative practices would entail? Yeah, so restorative practice and restorative justice so, is okay. the it's similar, right? So it's the idea that if somebody does harm to students and or the school building, um, that they're going to do something to make that up. And it's based on student decisions and, and a lot of conversation. Okay. Um, rather so than you'll have detention or you're suspended or, you know, so we've heard a lot of talk about um, restorative practice and restorative justice is definitely big buzzwords going on in education in Vermont right now. Um, and there's some interest in the schools to get going on that. Okay. Yeah, that's that helps a lot. I was trying to decide, are we talking about science class, or are we talking about yeah, yeah, discipline sorry, approach? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's a company here, standardized testing results do not match internal assessments. Why is such a large disparity? Mm -hmm. you mind explaining that a little bit? Um, so our local assessment plan for what we have, while right now it's incredibly hard to analyze that, those local assessments, because we don't have a place that it's all housed in one Place. We don't have a data management system, but we're working on that for next year. Um, from what we can see, our local assessment results, which are done by teachers, um, and kind of subjective because of that, are up here. And our standardized testing is pretty middle of the road. Um, so while those two things are somewhat apples and oranges, they're very far apart, and they should correlate in some way. You know, our local assessment plan should be an indicator as to how our kids are going to score on the standardized tests. And because there's such a disparity, and I want, my question is why? Why that disparity? Yeah, your so local assessment should tell you how you're doing up to, and so you're ready for. 
Yeah, it should, it should definitely correlate. So it's our internal assessments of standardized testing? No, it's our internal assessments of student learning and growth. Okay, but as it relates, because if you want it to correlate to standardized testing, then you well, just correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if, do you want our internal assessments to be a barometer for how prepared they are in anticipation of the standardized test? Yes. Okay. We should be able to say that we think they're pretty, that the level of rigor we're, 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 we're assessing it and teaching it matches the level of rigor of standardized testing. Right now, I don't know if we can make that statement. And, and I would say, as a teacher, I'm testing part way through before I get to that. And if my class isn't doing well at all, I know I have to do something differently to raise the level. And if I don't have any tests, I, I might think they're doing great, but I have any assessment to tell me that they need help or different kind of things. So how do you escape that becoming Teaching to the test. Teaching to the test, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it goes back to the innovation conversation, which is like, you know, a teacher on the that says, Right, okay. right. So, so glad I, I nailed the standard. So let's make sure we have an understanding of what a local assessment plan is and different types of assessment in a, in a classroom, right? So our local assessments are kind of dipsticks that we take three times a year, right? And usually the beginning or middle of the year towards the end of the year. Um, they're not a full standardized battery of tests. They generally take two class periods. You know, they're, they're very quick, and they should be standardized at some point. Not like aspect, but they, they have benchmarks and protocols and things like that. Some of the ones that our schools use are computerized, so they are more normed um, and have different references. And they're, they're dipsticks, they're screening measures. They're not um, giving the SBAC over and over and over again, right? That's not what's happening in any way, shape, or form. So those pieces have served two purposes. For me, they serve a purpose of looking at our program and thinking programmatically, are our kids where we say we think they are, right? And they are not teacher-created tests. Things made by other people, right? Um, and then, and they, so they give me that information programmatically. There's other form of types of assessments that teachers are doing all the time. You know, every day in their classroom to, to gauge their instruction and to change their instruction and, and to do what kids need, right? So that happens all day long, every day. Um, and that comes in two forms, in the summative and the formative. So a good metaphor for that is that your formative is like your checkup, your doctor's checkup, and a summative is your autopsy, right? <laughs> you're, you're done teaching that unit. You want to see how they've done. But the formative is how they're going along the way and how you need to change your instruction. So all of those things are happening all the time, none of which are geared exactly towards the SBAC. But it still should be a programmatic measure. So the SBAC is the end of the year autopsy, right? A big time autopsy, not a teacher created one, but a big time one. All of our local assessment plans should point to the fact that our kids are ready and prepared for the rigor of that particular assessment. Uh, because if we are getting programmatic measures all the time through the local assessment plan. I don't see what the teachers do on a daily basis. I don't need to see that. But the local assessment is just that kind of measure for us, and it's important for us internally to see how our programs are. Is that an assessment alignment or curriculum alignment with the with the SBAC or with the, the test at the end? Curricular, of the more curricular alignment. So if our local, if, if the SBAC for me, because of where they are, one of the questions I have, I don't know the answer to it yet, um, is does our curriculum match the rigor of that particular assessment? Because that assessment matches the rigor of what the Common Core is, and we have to go by the Common Core, right? Not to confuse Common Core state standards with the SBAC, they're not the same thing, right? So, um, so with that in mind, I, want, I just question that. I don't know the answer to that yet. Our local assessment plan scores are pretty high. I mean, they're, they're not, with the exception of some, some places in some schools on some tests, <laughs> they're pretty high. Um, so what does that tell us? That, can a, that a kid is reading, that we're teaching with snippets of information? Because generally our screeners are for reading are snippets. They're not longer texts. They're not demanding kids have a whole lot of stamina with text. So Ryan is a librarian. I'm sure you, like, it's different if you're reading a magazine article than you're reading a chapter book. You made an essay or a blog post. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, so, so there's lots of questions I have about that, yeah. programmatically, um, and we'll, we're going to dig into that and see if we can find it. Another big 
flag for us is that there is no way to follow a student in our system right now, and we're having this conversation with the administration team from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade, because we're not using similar, similar ways to measure them. Um, so when a kid goes from fourth grade to fifth grade, how are we having that conversation as to where the, that kiddo is academically and how do we support them? Because they're not talking the same language at the moment in terms of our assessment plan. So there's lots of questions around that piece um, with the local assessment plan that, that because there's such a difference in the SVAC scores in the local assessment plan that just the questions come up. And they're good questions to ask and they're good questions to dig into. Go ahead, uh, Libby, you mentioned that the data management system is underway. Do yeah. you have the resources to do that? We, I, yeah. I think we budgeted some for that in the last budget, but yeah, to so the resources. Really, did you? <laughs> Wasn't that the point of adding somebody else with IT? Uh, in the lab? Yeah. 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 Yes. We're not talking about a person, we're talking about a, um, a software program. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that the idea, part of the idea of adding the person? Is that we have the software but no one to run it? No, that we needed someone to help put capacity in the central. Yeah, office. that was a capacity oh, question. Data collection. Are you talking about the need to purchase an off-the-shelf solution of sorts? We, we are going to do that for yeah. software, yeah. But we don't need extra money to do that. We're finding that money elsewhere. But Great. That by being more efficient with our software purchases than we have in the past, we will pretty easily be able to come up with the money for that without any extra budgetary expense. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. I, I also love the fact I'm not even going in. We don't have to <laughs> do that. I love the fact that, um, that um, you're, you're out about once a month with your team, oh, your team and happens. you were saying it doesn't happen as much as you like. Well, I'm just excited that you're doing it because when I top principles. It's, there are a lot of principles that actually never do. They're not getting any of their observations done. So I'm glad there's a model of how to do it. Our not necessarily here. here. I'm not in this anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Our principles are in our classrooms a lot. Yeah, a lot. that's great. Yeah. Any other questions? This pop up, Andrew. You thought you said you had some earlier. I saw you. Any more? I can ask you off uh, I just have some small ones. Like I was wondering, do you have an org chart for the administration? Because there's a lot of very basic lessons. one right now. Yeah. Very basic one. Um, and with the budgetary cycle, should we be able to get hire a human resource officer? I'm going to reshuffle um, responsibilities at the central office level because of that. Because mm -hmm. things will be taken off people's plates, and we need to be more efficient with other things, and we need to add some responsibilities on the central office level. So I hesitate to do that right now without knowing that position is going to come <laughs> or not. Okay. Do you have any idea what's driving the disparity in attendance? Um, Jim asked me that today <laughs> or there. Um, I have some ideas on, on that. Um, I'm sure Heather and Tracy have some ideas on that too. Uh, there are several factors that could be coming into play around the disparity in attendance. Um, but I have, there's some. I mean, one is that they're little kids and tend to have snotty noses <laughs> or don't have proper hygiene there. Um, others are that, I, while I don't, I couldn't tell you the exact data on this, um, it might be that we have younger teachers at the elementary school because that, that's a trend in many places and they have smaller children. And so their kids get sick. Wondering. You know, like there, it could be that. Um, it could be that there's hasn't been a real high level of um, insistence that they're there at that particular building, um, and that they're missed when they're gone. You know, so there are lots of things that are floating around in my mind around why the discrepancy, um, but it's big, it's noticeable. If you're a new teacher, to you catch everything those first couple. Of years. <laughs> okay. But, well, I mean, I think I can speak just anecdotally that when my children were, are and were in elementary school, it was made very clear to us, and we were very appreciative that, that, it, that um, educational experiences outside of school were valued, and that if, if we had our children doing things, traveling or whatever it might be, that that was actually really... Oh, no, 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 this is referencing teacher teacher, 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 teacher. teacher. Sorry, Steve. Okay. No, 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 it's my fault, I didn't read it carefully yeah, enough. Yeah, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, oh, we haven't noticed that. Okay. I haven't tracked student absenteeism yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. I haven't tracked that data. 
that's well, that I read that totally wrong. So actually, I've never noticed that. Uh -huh. Have you as a parent? I have uh, not as a parent. No, um, I haven't. Or, you know, the number of sub days of substitutes or whatever we experience. Seems normal to you. Never experienced yeah. that. Good. Never yeah. seen a lack of commitment or a lack of any kind of, it's never felt that way. Yeah, no, okay. my, my kids don't, you know, frequently come home. Same, I have a guess it's nah. yeah. Average, what did it mean uh, under federal grant inv investments? It says through leadership for a loop when taking the reins in July. It's on the second to last page under. Well, that was referring to the fact that when we started, we being Mike and I, started on July 3rd or whatever it was, we found out that the, the contingent improvement plan hadn't been submitted um, and what we didn't have any information on it. And we, that's, that's just referencing that we had to do a very quick turnaround around that piece um, and rewrite the entire thing very quickly. Mike said that when he presented it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's referencing. Okay. Going forward, it will be a nice, much cleaner process because we'll have a better sense. Excellent. Do you um, feel like you've had opportunities to connect with um, the broader community? I've seen you at lots of events. I was just curious. So I know you've been there. I just was curious if you feel like that. I think I can do more yeah. of it. Um, I'll tell you honestly, I was telling Jim earlier today, it's not my strength because I'm such an introvert. Like that really, I really have to force myself to get out and talk to people who are not immediately connected to education. <laughs> so it's my own personal, like, I got to do that. Um, so I really have to look to, for areas that I can, and I, I ask any of you to support me in that and say, let me go. You know, I've reached out to Tina, and I'm going out to the Senior Center with Tina. Um, so if there's any opportunities for me to be more visible in the community at events and things like that, then please, I welcome that feedback, particularly in Roxbury, because um, I haven't seen, I haven't been able to be part of the community very much here in Roxbury, so, or meet many people from Roxbury. Um, so I welcome any feedback or invitations and, and that kind of thing to get me out there more. But yeah, I have been to every event that Absolutely. I can. I've seen you at Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's more. I've done a pretty good job in covering the faces. I've, I'm trying I, to be that smiling face. And yeah, <laughs> and there's some places that are, you know, I think you're investing in time in places that, that matter think, for yeah. the position you're in. I think, I think one thing we recognized when, we, when you were hired was that it was going to be I don't know if we use this term with you, but we used it uh, so to kind of ground you to your desk for a while. The idea is that you really had a lot of work to do to kind of get on track. Yeah. And that we, we recognize that, that, you know, uh, the bureaucratic pieces and then the teacher relationships were going to have to come, that the staff relationships are going to have to come first. It's going to take many months to get through that stuff. But then there'll be a time down the road when you feel like, okay, it's going the way you want it to. And, we can in introduce you to more people out in the community and have you be more that that communication face. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I, I don't think anyone feels like it's a deficit at this point, but I think it'd be great as we move forward and you feel like, okay, I got five seconds in my day now. We'd love to introduce you to more people. Um, in the old days, there used to be things like, you know, somebody'd have a party at their house when a new administrator would come on and they'd meet you know, 30 of their friends and those friends just happened to talk to everyone else in town. And so it was a chance to just people to get to know you on a human level. So those things could still happen if there was time and, yeah. you know. Yeah, thanks so. for that. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, so I know it's an expectation, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> I have it on my plate. <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, there's time and place for everything. So we really appreciate all everything you're doing. And, you know, and also I think that the principals have been really doing that. They've stepped up their game. I think, especially I've noticed that, you know, elementary and middle, they really, they're kind of like doing more communication, and then I think, um, you know, Mike Berry has taken up the mantle of Mr. Communicator. Yeah. So that has really supported everything that's going on by, I don't think people are feeling like, where, is the, where are those administrators? They seem to not even exist. You know, there's nothing like that going on. So I think you're okay. Okay. And even though there are a few glitches yet to do on the website, I think that helps for the people who don't have any kids in the system. So when they're looking for something and go to the website, we'll get so they can find it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments or feedback to look into more deeply?
Yeah, this is a great report. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you great. so much. Thorough and informative and easy to I love how it's not really a narrative format. <laughs> uh, Steve likes the bullet points. Like That's what I'm learning. Tables, bullets, <laughs> outlines. <laughs> like, we don't need anything longer than two sentences. <laughs> Remember that essay blog discussion? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the refined form of the blog now. <laughs> okay, it's all of your civil servants need. First, are we ready to move on to the budget? Sure. Um, any community outreach to report? I have. Uh, no. I brought the community outreach to the fall festival. Uh, <laughs> So we were at the Fall Festival, which I thought was really nice. I don't know if folks who were there later had more people to talk to. Not that many people stopped by when Becky and I were there, but, or Michelle was there earlier. But I will say that we were able to have longer conversations with a couple of people. I had a, Michelle and I had a long conversation with a parent about the health curriculum, which I think has continued to be a topic of discussion and some action in the community. Um, and I had a long conversation with them about busing. So it was, even though I didn't talk to them, it was an opportunity to get more in depth. Um, we had this. Lisa, thank you, school board members. Later start time for uh, middle school and high school to correspond with natural time clock of teenagers. Less fundraising for kids, better funded field trips, foreign language commitment at Union and beyond, continue to focus on diversity, equity, and anti-bias training. This must be ongoing, accountable, and a high priority. Thank you for your service. Um, some of the little sticky notes I think were from some of our younger constituents. Yes, Ryan and I uh, have a large collection of young people who came and added to the box. You probably yes, tell them. The four day week yeah. suggestion. <laughs> younger, um, happy, kind yeah. about the vision. Yeah. More recess, also another vote for the four day week. Six day week. Um, having more time for science, uh, keep kids at the top of priorities. A note of gratitude. Students and families of color need a safe avenue to address concerns. Who can we talk to when something doesn't feel okay? Who will listen? Who will respond? A request for more collaboration across all of the schools and grades. Um, more opportunity to dress up. I think it's also <laughs> a student <laughs> company. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> one of those things is perfect. I know, they're great. Right. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Well, Answer hmm. which question? Which question? The yeah. question about who students of color and families of color um, can talk about issues that they're facing in a safe and private manner. Yeah, absolutely. You can come to me or any one of the principals at any given time. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity with, with these three, actually Bridget, mm -hmm. Steve, and Ryan, to speak with the wonderful students involved Amazing. in the Racial, Racial Justice Alliance. Um, when was that? Tuesday? Monday? Monday. 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 Such an articulate group of pe people. Um, and I had a private conversation with Marianne afterwards saying, you know, my office is right there, so come whenever you want to. And she said, I've never heard that before. You know, thank you. I, I might take you up on that. I was like, please do. And then I saw her, her mom in the hallway later, I introduced myself and gave the same message to her mom. So yeah, anytime any community member wants to come talk, just let me know. The door's open. And kid, especially kids. And I think we're looking at a more and more systematic response to that also in addition to the fact that everyone on staff, especially leadership, um, is preparing itself and is already prepared but is increasing its skills to be able to be those avenues of yeah. safety. Mm -hmm. But we're also looking at a in more systematic approaches too. And so it's part of the proposal from the students um, that we're considering the policy. So we're a little ways from being able to um, Hopefully next time we can talk about it more seriously and, and show you guys what they're working on and what we've kind of how we're responding to it. But it's um, yeah. There's also yeah. there's a, a very formal response in that we do have 
a hazing, harassment, and bullying policy. And under that policy, we have people who are the designated reporters, reporters in each school. But I, I think the hope is that there are less formal channels. Well, before that's really important to know what you just said, because yeah. I think people may not understand that there are actually, that when anything occurs related to basically harassment, um, that it that it's instantly triggers action by the district. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there's a process that has, that occurs, and that's a state mandated process <coughs> effectively. So at least that there needs to be one. We and just had three, three or four of our administrators attend an HHB training just one day this week. Yeah. Okay. Well, is, is that policy available on mm -hmm. the website? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. With the procedure. Well, and I think it's really important for the district to aim to have every adult who's in a supervisory capacity with children, you know, teachers, et cetera, be people who are trained to deal with these issues and be able to talk to students and have students feel that they can come mm -hmm. to them and have it be handled in a, in a sensitive and effective way, even if that's not the end of the chain. Absolutely, but, yeah. And, and I think short of that or in enhancing that in addition to the issues of like a safe response or a safe person to go to, one of the things that we're all working on this year is raising all of our competency around this as a district so that um, the experience a student has in the hallways or in the classroom or in a complaint procedure, whatever it may be, that it's done with much more understanding of, of race and really all um, all cultural sensitivities too and so there's sort of a sense of um, we've got a long way to go we know it and we're working on it now it, this is this is the year we're working on it effectively so and it began honestly I think to some extent with with the administrative hirings we did as we really kind of started to take this very seriously um, well it actually began with black lives with the black lives matter flag yeah. that really began with the students right and then it translated directly that and so the the challenge from students has been Let's take the symbolic action of the Black Lives Matter flag and turn it into a district mission, right? And that's sort of that transitioning from a symbolic action to, to actually turning our district towards it as, a, as part of our core mission is what we're working on now. That's great. So I took your advice and took the um, grants. My advice? Yeah. Oh. And went to the seniors, the group of seniors. And um, so uh, their comments were they knew we are coming up to paying the bond this time around, right? And um, that it was, nonetheless, even after that, it's hard for them to comment unless they know how it's going to affect their taxes. And so um, that's understood. And um, they felt that Montpelier was still above average people spending. And that um, they wanted you to know if they're going to pay for the bond payment, they can't afford much more. Is Montpelier above average in per people spending? No. I didn't think so. No, it is. We're actually right on average, yeah. basically. Right. We're, we're so close that it's, in fact, this year it might be different than it was last time. And I think that includes, I think that's kind of Washington County based, too. Well, we're actually below average for Washington County. <laughs> Are we? I think we're the second lowest in the county. I think we're one of the lowest. Yeah, and we're but we're state average for the state. Yeah. 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 Virginia, you remind me at the fall festival when we were standing there. We had a box with people putting comments in for the vision, and then we had a tablet that people were writing down themes. Everything you just read was an amalgamation of all that, correct? Yeah, I don't think the difference really came across that well. So I think what really That's mattered right. was, did you want your comment to be visible, or did somewhere. you want your comment to go in the yeah. box? Which is fine. Right. <laughs> it was the first time. Yeah, we tried to get some feedback for the vision, but it doesn't seem like we really got anything to direct that effort. I think as we realized at the retreat, that putting together a vision is way too, is very complicated. It's not something probably that was that amenable to people dropping by a table. Between the whole day. So is there a way to journalize that stuff somehow so we can keep it in the record of comments for the, for the budget preparation? Isn't that kind of what we're trying to do here is, and yours too? Like how do we? We can take that and yeah. then add it to. I mean, just a short type up yeah. probably. And the same with these. Sure. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Any more on community outreach? This is so at least some more to do. Of some of the members have reached out in the community about getting it formed together. So seven is kind of our deadline. So what day? Seven. Mm -hmm. I mean, for it to yeah really yeah be meaningfully incorporated. I was going to say, I know Lisa attended the open house as a board member. Um, we have talked about going to one of the Monday senior lunches. I don't know if she actually made it or not. Uh, when I spoke with her earlier this week to make sure that I could maybe consolidate our gatherings. It sounds like outdoor education, um, stronger focus there was an interest from the Roxbury side, music, and good pay for teachers. It was the limited feedback we picked up from Roxbury. So, nothing too crazy, but... What is what is the music program? Is there any music available? At? There is, so oh, it's yeah. a part time. Yeah, yep. part -time. Yeah. Can we get the, the minutes somehow? Maybe you just write those three down and sure. Maybe put them, in, we'll put them in with the others or something. Yeah. We'll just have a document that has yeah. the themes. Mm -hmm. Somebody suggested to me that I go and probably any, any board member go to the, I guess there are parent groups that work on fundraising for different initiatives um, at the middle school and high school and maybe elementary school level as well. Um, and they thought it would be, I mentioned that I was on the finance committee and they said, oh, well, you should go and hear from these groups about what they're doing and what their interests are. And Somebody so. has been to the elementary yeah. school. Well, Somebody's been to all of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, but you should Great. feel free to reach out if you just want yeah. to okay. talk to people. Okay. Yeah, and it might be good to attend somebody with just because they're um, pretty involved with the parents and it would be good to introduce yourself to them. Great. How would I get information about how to contact them? Is that through Libby? Yeah, it's yeah. the meeting yeah. that I can get okay. for Thank you. And then the meetings are on the calendar. Thank you very much. There you go. We can draw the calendar on the website. Thank you, Mike Barry. Uh, ready for playground update from Andrew? Yep. Andrew, you want to join just at the end of the table there? Sure. Yeah, sure. Sort of this this piece that uh, I think was the impetus for my joining us, joining you. Uh, playground to give you a little update as to where we're at. That, um, had a job meeting this morning. We're having what well, we have weekly job meetings um, on Wednesday mornings. Um, the vestibule foundations are in. They were backfilling today. Steel is going to start being erected in the next week. This is don't believe it until you see it, but. That's the schedule I hear. Um, so, uh, as I said, the concrete is, uh, is poured, back milling, steel next week. The inner courtyard, they have um, disposed of all the contaminated soil. They are in the process the next, over the next few days doing their under drain and basically going to be buttoning up the dirt work in the courtyard probably the end of this week, early next week basically putting that to bed for the winter. Um, their next main focus is going to be working on the retaining wall. Doing some, we're working through some of the details and some of the uh, best ways to uh, tackle some of the walls construction, whether we do sheet piling, this temporary all this means and method stuff. Is that just the wall on the back or is it on the side too? Just on the back. Okay. Just on the back, yeah. So they will be, uh, they're going to be working on that over the next couple weeks. Um, but they are looking good to, then they'll be moving to the upper courtyard. They're kind of waiting on that while they do some staging, leave some staging area for the vestibule work and access to the back. But they're, they're feeling very good about being sort of all the heavy lifting done this winter before they button it up for the, the, the snow. So is all of the contaminated soil gone? Or no, is there just, in the, just, just in the inner courtyard. Yeah, just the lower. Yeah. And will um, the soil from the top be gone before we I'm sorry? The that contaminated again? soil that's on the top? Um, probably most of it, yeah. 
Yeah, that's somebody asked me that the other day. Yeah, yeah, their hope, their hope is to basically have all the excavation done, kind of rough grading, get it stabilized for the winter, maybe for the staircase, that's just sort of, because that's sort of, everything's going to build off that staircase that leads up to the nest. That'll be weather dependent, but they're, they're in good shape with regards to schedules. Um, so that's good news. Um, so I, a couple of weeks ago, three, three, four weeks ago, I was asked to meet with the, the playground committee group, kind of their concern about that because they're so heavily involved throughout the whole process, that, that gap, that domino that we had to push about taking the equipment out of the lower playground to, to get the project going so we could um, to get to the point we are now. And as part of that, they asked that I put together a little financial summary and a little, some of the, the key pieces they wanted to know was sort of financially where were we and what would it cost to put the, the drawings back, the project back as it was bid, as well as sort of the, some of the, the key dates with regards to when some of these decisions had to be made and also sort of just financially where we are. So what I put together was uh, a little document here which I'm sure Grant cringes at my use of the words balance sheet, but it's a little document that I put together and I'll, I'll explain it before I hand it out. That basically what I put here was all the revenue sources that we had for the project, bond, fund balance, grants. Over here were all the expenses to date. This basically reflects start of construction. And what it told us was that we had a positive balance of $186,000. So once we get into construction and we start taking in consideration some of the disposals, fees of the soil, which we, we found an off-site, uh, a local uh, depository for the, um, some of the yellow soils, but we have to pay to do that. So there's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be a cost associated with that. But we also get a credit from the contractor because they don't have to ship it to Coventry. So again, a balance sheet is sort of where we may see some extra money, and then where we're going to see additional expenses. So we're all sugared out. These are very rough numbers, but luckily when I was at the, uh, the playground committee meeting, their numbers kind of matched up with mine, so I was, I was happy about that. So where it stands right now, sort of best case scenario, we don't run into any oil tanks out there. Um, everything continues. As the project stands, we've got about $62,000, on paper anyway, towards being able to, to reinstitute the playground, the inner courtyard, which all sounds great until you look at the second part of this, which is those big chunks that we had to take out of the project to get it rolling. And Because of the nature of you, you get your best price when you put a product, when you put it out to bid, when you got three other people, you know, bidding against you, um, and everything is coordinated smoothly. So as you put things back into the project, they get a little more expensive. Some things are kind of a wash. Some things, not so much. So some of the major components that we kind of broke out was the amphitheater, which to put the amphitheater back in is anywhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars. And that's on the upper playground. That's the upper playground amphitheater. That one's a decision that we're probably going to need to give um, ECI somewhere in January or February. They don't need to know that right now, but they're going to need to know it soon, relatively soon. Is that why it says construction priority, Andrew? Yes. Yes. Second piece, big chunk that we looked at was um, the fire lane and uh, sidewalk. Basically, I apologize for not bringing a plan, but basically from the vestibule down to the cafeteria, that was originally designed to be concrete. We took a cost savings to turn that to asphalt. Still going to be structurally sound, still going to be a fire lane, but concrete is nicer than asphalt. And, uh, but 
But that's a forty to sixty thousand dollar ad to put that back in. Site lighting. This actual number we we actually have we, we lucked out on that one in that we found a, a less expensive fixture. Light fixtures are amazing because you can buy a light fixture for two thousand dollars, but somebody makes one that looks pretty darn similar. If it's up high enough from outside or whatever, you wouldn't know the difference for you know a, a third of the price or a quarter of the price. So we actually were able to put the site lighting back in for twenty five hundred dollars. I've already approved that. Um, lower playground equipment. So this number is anywhere from ten to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> And that was one of the things that we we need to explain to people is that if someone comes in through that door and says, here's $150,000, we can build that back the way it was drawn. And if somebody comes through with $40,000, we're not going to turn them away because we can't get exactly what was drawn. We will take that $40,000 and we will talk with the administrators at the school and the, the people that know best of what the right equipment for the kids are if we have a limited amount and we will integrate that back into the design. So, but the takeaway is we took about $150,000 worth of play equipment out of the inner courtyard. And this, with regards to that, I make that comment about someone giving out money that was in the context of a fundraising group. Um, lower courtyard sidewalk. We had a sidewalk that went through twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars. Again, the one that was drawn is probably thirty-five thousand dollars. If we did with one that was less, it's going to be less. Um, that's another one that, depending on when we give, if we give them the okay to do it now, it's going to be cheaper than if we give it the okay after they do the grading and the you know more refined grading. Plantings, we took probably we did took close to sixty thousand dollars worth of plantings out of this project. Um, again, that's a number that we don't have to you you know sixty thousand is on our drop that we get we decide to put fifteen we can put fifteen back in. Could you explain? You skipped over the a lower courtyard. Oh, mulch. Uh, yes. So as part of the design, there was a large area of the lower courtyard that was a mulch. Not where they're playing, just a mulch. And there was areas that were under equipment. There was areas that were just large mulched areas. Um, so what would you put under the equipment if you didn't put the mulch? Oh, we would do it, definitely do it under the equipment. You have to. Absolutely, yeah, under the equipment. But the, 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 like I said, there were large swaths that were just mulch, mulch. areas. Okay. You know, whether they had a sandbox in them or a lower play structure. Um, and those would be grass instead, or? That's what, it, that, we put a place, when we did our, let's get the, let's push the domino over. We priced, put soft, put grass in there. And we knew that if we decided to do some mulch or we decided to do something else, we at least had, it was, in any other terms, I would have said we, would, we put $4 a square foot out there. And whatever it turns out to be, it turns out to be. So is that what the $10,000 to $40,000 represents, the area of mulch as opposed right. to? If we wanted to put it all back, it would probably cost us $40,000 to put that mulch back. And it was thick and deep, and mulch is expensive. You've got to maintain it. And keeping it, there's some rules that we have to maintain it to a certain depth as well. It, it's yeah, it's not just. It's, it's not, it's not a one-time cost. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Does that have? Well, that's what I was thinking of. Even under playground equipment, it's yeah, a it's, debate for years about what's best under yeah. playground equipment, and whatever you put, you have to maintain it because the kids mess it up. Mm -hmm. That's the way it goes. Um, but remember, we've been mulching on these playgrounds for a long, long time. I don't know if we've been doing it well, but we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. So we've had that in our budgets. Yeah. Um, again, plantings, we took close to $60,000 worth of plantings out. Uh, and then there was sort of miscellaneous bike racks and flagpoles and other sort of things that we took out to, to push the domino. Um, so, we needed when we when we got our 1.9, and we needed to get it down to 1.3. And this is actually probably reflects more the sort of 1.6 down to 1.3, um, because the, that when the bids came in at 1.9, we were able to take 300 grand out of it pretty easily without really affecting anything. You know, no one was going to notice that we substituted. 10 linear feet of, current, of granite for grass, you know, those sorts of things. So this, this really reflects that 1.6 down to 1.3. Um, 
down to the one three, which unfortunately translates to 440, that 300,000. Um, so that's, that, that, this was sort of the, the summary that I conveyed to that group. Um, Thank you. Yeah. What was the discussion from that group? Um, they rightfully feel a lot of um, pride in, in the work they've done. Mm -hmm. And it's a large group. Mm -hmm. And it varied from some very strong feelings about what should be done and how we should do it to, you know, we do need to make some compromises. And I think there's also a acknowledgement that though they are focused on this project, there's a larger bond that affects a lot of students in other buildings and will affect them as well. And the message I gave them at that point is, let's be patient, because this stuff can all go back in. The amphitheater is probably the one piece that we really said, we really ought to do now. Because once we, everything else out here can kind of be done with shovels and a, and a little bobcat. The amphitheater, that you got to get the heavy equipment in. And once we build this, we're not going to want to put that piece of equipment back there. Um, so, so you're saying that needs to come under this general, general contract? I think, I, I think if, if you said we've got, we're, we need to focus on something, that would be the one that I would say you really ought to focus on right now. Get that, let's get a price for it, let's build it. Because again, once we build the, the playground, the work that it's going to take to put the amphitheater back in is you're going to have planting beds and all that. You're just not going to get the bolt. You're not going to get the backhoe back up there to to dig and, and put the blocks in to create the amphitheater once you've built the rest of it. So one of the ideas is use the GC who's on site to, to finish up the, the big earth moving project. The other pieces can be done under small contracts later. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Or now or whenever. Yeah, but the yeah. point is, is incorporate it as a change order back into the project now, absolutely. Or again, the play equipment. If, if there's a, however, and I remind myself, policy is not what I'm paid for. So, you know, however, it's decided to, to be done. Yeah. And, and that's how it's going to, and that's something that I, I hope everyone understands is that we're not going back to that original design. Unless, unless within the next six months, or you know, five, six months, you know, there's a big chunk of money that gets committed to it. It's not going to look exactly. Yeah. If the intent is going to be the same, the enjoyment is going to be the same. It's it's going to be a playground the kids and the community is going to value. But it's probably not going to look like. And so I, I think I'm I'm just suspending the political discussion sure. for a minute to talk about the efficiency question. What kind of penalty do you pay for change orders? Um, there is there's a fifteen percent markup on change orders beyond beyond the normal beyond they'll should they'll, you ask them for what we want to put the sidewalk in now they'll run the numbers and say it's x amount of dollars per cubic yard of dirt and fill and all this and they'll run the numbers and put fifteen percent markup on that's beyond the normal ten or whatever you would pay on everything or or is it oh, not we don't know what we're paying in markup for okay okay yeah. all right. but it, as part of the bid process they tell us what you are going to be paying for change orders. And I say 15%, I honestly don't recall what their change order, but that, that's kind of similar, right. anywhere between 10 and 15. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so. would, just to follow up on Steve's question there, would all of these items, if we were to pursue, or if we were to pursue any of these items, would each one require a change order, or no, not this you, change well, order? You, you would do it as, it wouldn't matter, the 15%. So would, would do the 15%. But the 15% would come on top of any of these. Right. So it, it, they are all changes. So they're all add back ins. Yeah. So to do them under a separate contract, you could conceivably change, save fifteen percent, but you have no idea what your new contract cost would be. So yeah, and and that fifteen percent, quite honestly, no, I, I was going to say some of these things they may not even do it. If something done like a piece of concrete, right. they may not even do it. Yeah, because they haven't. They don't have to come back repair it. They don't have to maintain it. If it dies, they don't have to come. They may just say, "All right, well, you were going to pay X amount of dollars for how many cubic yards of asphalt you're not going to play it for." That may be a little generous, people. Are. Right. I've got to remember people in for business, so the 15 percent is probably going to be. I'm at the tail end of a big project myself, and I it's the same nonsense. You're yeah. trying to figure out what to do now, what to wait on. 
Yeah. And, and that's, and, and I've got to come a better word than cavalier, but that's just the reality of it. And, and you can't get too worked up about it. It's the position we're in, and to fight it or worry too much about it is wasted energy. There's a situation, there's a contract in place, and changes are changes, and... And I don't know if there are many contracts that get exactly what they wanted yeah. in the beginning, yeah. when yeah. the end is through, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And the markups, and, and the thing to remember with the markup and overhead and profit and all that is, they're getting paid for a service. And if something goes wrong, we pick up the phone and say, come back and fix it. If something heaves or something shifts, you know, there's value there. It's not just giving the money away for nothing. The plantings, were they, were they just uh, you know, decorative and enjoyment? Or were, were any of, are any of them relevant to sort of stabilization? Or no, not all of them. No, most of them were decorative. Absolutely. Did you ask the group, or did the group voice to you, you know, if you have the sixty-two thousand two hundred fifty dollars, what their priorities were, what they felt like we should spend it? How um, Libby, you can back me up on this. Libby and I were. I apologize. Libby and I both. I think that we just asked them to be patient. That we had time, and that that's, this meeting was not the time to start thinking about. We talked. That, that was also what a month ago. It was yeah. a while ago. So the idea that. I mean, we're further along in the project now, so Andrew can be a little bit more um, confident in that, in that number, whereas when we met with him, we weren't confident in that number. So we said, we, we have a hunch we're going to have that, but we're not positive, so we didn't even allow the discussion to take place because it would have been spreadless. Yeah. And, and once we get, it'll be, we got $60,000 in contingency. Um, once we're out of the ground, so to speak, I don't know what the expression is of civil projects, but once we're once we're above grade and the mysteries are solved and we don't we don't front run into those oil tanks, you know, we we know what they're gonna build on top of it. They bid that. So that money will be will free up. But until we're into that position, we shouldn't touch that. Are you talking about the sixty two? That's contingency. Yeah. The top okay. sixty two. So you'll know more about that when you get to the upper playground. Absolutely. Some of the other things that have changed uh, that the the revenue the so the contaminated soils um, though we did find an offsite a local site for disposal their request is that they want to build on their property someday and we're in Montpelier clay right now the expectation is when we move to the upper playground we're going to get better soils that they'll want but right now the soils that we're pulling out are just clay and, and they don't want them, understandably. So that's being shipped up to Coventry. Oh, which is not contaminated, just your key soil? Uh, the, way, <laughs> the way the soil is sort of categorized is there's green soil, which is perfectly good. Mm -hmm. There's yellow soil, which is perfectly good to stay on site or the state house lawn or within a city limit, an urban limit. There's purple soil, which is contaminated, which needs to go mm -hmm. up to Coventry. The yellow soil is unfortunately not, it's Montpelier clay, and we don't want to reuse it under our, we don't want to use it underneath our play equipment, so other people don't want to use it under their potential future buildings. So that's also going to Coventry until we hit soils that we can ship the berry or reuse on site. So which of the soils is berry taking? They're not yellow. Just, good oh, yellow. Okay. Good, good yellow, yellow soil. Oh, not that's clay, okay. yellow soil. I got it. Yeah. All right. Or we can reuse it on site. But we're still... So some of the soil is still going to Coventry. All of it is going to Coventry so far. So far. But that's, again, that's sort of the, the lower courtyard. We think that the upper courtyard is going to have more fill, more sandy soils that we can ship locally. But there's no guarantee on that. So that, that revenue of 36 is probably is going to get... I actually, when I showed it to the group, I put it at 75%. I'm down to 50%. So I think that number is actually probably, that revenue is probably going to go lower, a little lower. So, so you have, on the amphitheater, you only have two or three months to make a decision on that. We probably have a little more than that. Okay. Uh, I, was, I wanted to be conservative in this. Yeah. Um, the big piece with that is the drainage behind the amphitheater. Mm -hmm. you know, the water comes down the hill and we got to get it from behind the, the block 
knots, whatever those are, and tie that into the drainage. But it's a relatively simple operation, so that, I don't think it's going to be that complicated. I do think that um, it's worth talking about at some point soon, not perhaps tonight, but for us to think about, be very clear about who makes that decision. Yeah. So that community members aren't upset, and you all aren't upset, and people aren't upset with you, and people aren't upset with me and Andrew, and <laughs> you know that we're very clear about how these decisions are going to be made. Yeah. I mean, I, I do. I mean, I think the amphitheater does have a kind of community component to it. Um, every bit of this does. I mean, every bit of it does, but um, maybe it goes kind of beyond people with kids. Um, oh, I see what you mean. I see yeah. what you mean. You mean it has a, a, a community use, value, a, a community use, use that, yeah. behind it. Um, that, you know, I don't. Forty thousand dollars is forty thousand dollars. We give the overall scope of the project. I think to forego that if we don't have to um, would be an opportunity missed. I think to tie more people into the space. I'm interested in exploring what you were trying to say there, Libby, around around yeah, decision. clarifying decision making, and I, I think it's important to community to board members because this is an extraordinarily important project to the community, and. I think that it is, it is a high budget priority for a lot of us on the board um, as because we hear this, we know it from our community. And so what we want to do is, you know, I mean, there's good management of a project like this in terms of, you know, well, yes, we can pace things a little bit. We can see if we just spread them out a little bit, we can do everything, that kind of thing. Um, but those are squirrely answers that don't satisfy people who are not insiders. And so I think what we want to be careful of is to not just explain how the decision will be made, but to really be clear what the decision is. And I think that the more we can get that information out early, the better. Um, you know, because for one thing, I would advocate pretty strongly in any budget discussion that we fund the hell out of this thing. I think it needs to be done. And I may be the only one on the board who thinks that way, but I think what we want to do is really make sure we, we you know, help us figure out what the best process for getting this, uh, getting the community's input heard and then integrating that as best you can into what you have to do financially to run the district. So, you know, I think we need to make sure we, we're very clear with everything, not just who's making the decision, but when's the decision going to be made and, and, and what's the, what recourse is there and all those other things. And, and the why. So that, for example, if yeah. there's something on the list that Andrew says, well, we could hire somebody later on to put in planting right. because they were only, and so it's not that it's never going to happen, but not this year. Right. No. And there's I a mean, reason for that, right? Right, yeah. and yeah. the reason, because I think people want to know, well, why'd right. you cut that and put in yeah. that? But not this year is a bad answer, right? It's got to be in 2020 or whatever. That would be the answer people would want to hear rather than not this year, because yeah. not this year is the ultimate bureaucratic answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But as of we want to make promises, we can't. Let's make some promises and keep them. There's a lot of need in the system. Exactly. And there's an entire yeah. building that got very little out of the bond and right. has its own playground needs. Absolutely. Its own infrastructure needs. Absolutely. And there's been a lot of money put into the playground. And it's going to be a good playground. Yeah. It's going right. to be a good playground regardless. So but let's let's have that <clears throat> exact discussion so we're clear where we're going to end up on this. And I see you gritting your teeth a little bit. I am gritting my teeth a little bit. As I said in a meeting just yesterday, that Jim can attest to, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, well, it's just this amount of money, mm -hmm. let's just do it. Those just this amount of money add up. So there are a lot of priorities and there's a lot of needs. Yeah. Um, so how do, we, how do we put all those things in perspective um, so that we're making really good decisions for our financial responsibilities as well as our student responsibilities. And maybe it just won't be helped by the fact that we're beginning the budget session right season just now to see what are our priorities. Are there other ones that are bigger and how do they all work in together? It's a good time to be talking. In terms of facility needs, and assu I mean, assuming the money doesn't, we don't get more money out of the way this is structured with the contingency, that's a different question. That money's already budgeted for here. But purely in terms of the overall district facility needs, it would be very hard for me to say we should commit to fully fund the playground if we have not 
gotten a much bigger picture of our facilities needs and particularly of the needs at the middle school which were not addressed in the bond and which I think are significant because I, I do think it you know it's not an endless pie unfortunately I and I think the pie should be very very big but I, I'm not sure it's an endless pie and the middle school has to be a priority too yeah I mean I, I think the importance is inclusion and communication and thoughtfulness about decision making and, and explanation um, kind of ad nauseum because yeah. if, it, if it trickles out or if it's an inconsistent process or if some people know and some people don't, there's going to be that you know, game of telephone that goes on and um, I think the more consistent and transparent it is. And I think just being honest with where we're not able to make decisions and why. We, we don't know what the contingency is. Here's what we're thinking about, but we're not at the decision point. Here's what the decision point's going to look like. Here's the inputs that are going to go into the decision. Um, because, I mean, I, I, I agree with Steve, this is a high priority. I also agree with Bridget that um, we, you know, we have to make some choices along the way. Um, and I think we have to make those choices methodically and intelligently. Um, and I, I think we have to work hard to kind of bring the community along with us, even if it's going to take some, some patience. Because I, I think you're right, Andrew. It's, we're going to have a great program. We're going to have it soon. Uh, it might not be the exact playground people envisioned. Um, it might take another step or two even to get you know, to where I think we all want it to be. But I think that communication is key. And I would su suggest that, as we told that group, without being patient, this is 1.17 million out of a bond. You've got close to two something million dollars worth of bids coming in. And like we had to make some hard decisions here, maybe making some hard decisions on the other projects as well. I mean, we all know you sit at any stoplight in town and you just wonder where all the truck drivers are coming from. I mean, it's, when was the last time we saw this amount of construction in Montpelier? Forget the state. I mean, we can actually see it in Montpelier for ourselves, which often we don't. It's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, and to Jim's point, I'd say thank you for meeting with this group yes, of thank parents. You. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and it's fantastic. Would, and for this work, it's yeah. excellent. And I would, you know, continue to reach out to that group. Yeah, and we, and we assured them, we assured them that, you know, we weren't going to be making any, we, 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 um, we, assured them that we had things in control and that there were decisions that we had to make on our own and that we couldn't involve them in every decision, just like we can't involve you guys in every decision. But we have a good sense of, you know, I've been, I was, prior to this, I was an architect of Blackboard Design. I've been designing tens of millions of dollars worth of schools in my career. And I know where the, you know, $2,500 change order to get lights back in the project, I can make that decision. What the amphitheater is made out of, what it looks like, we're going to go back to the right group. And I think it's us. Whether it's the group of 12 that we met with, or two representatives from that group, and two representatives of this group, and we assure them that we will make the appropriate, we will reach out the appropriate time and ask for their input. And um, like I say, like that discussion of, of clarifying that we. we we're going to be the ultimately the ones, though they've been involved in this process, and a lot of people can be involved in the process. Ultimately, the phone's going to ring at Liddy's desk and, and my desk, and so we can be the ones on the trigger and stuff. So. I just want to be really clear that we hear it every week from constituents, every week, and that, that they're not sure what's going on with the playground, they're concerned about the playground, that they they are not convinced that the administration is committed to pushing this thing forward. There's a lot of that, and we don't. We, you know, we, we know what we hear here at the meeting, um, but it's been going on a, a lot of years, and it, it's really important. I mean, I will take my cue from the confidence of constituents. Basically, if they're feeling like they're in good hands, great. So I just encourage y'all to to. You know, give us the tools to talk to them, and you do the same. And then, you know, and let's get through this so that people are feeling like they're well respected through this. Um, 
I don't, I'm not comfortable with pitting it against the middle school. I want to be it's very It's not clear. about pitting it, Steve. It's well, about it's exactly what, what I the, heard. What the, it's about understanding what all of the needs right. are. Before but I heard you use middle school as the example, which would be pitting it against the middle school. I, I'm a big believer the middle school needs a lot of help. I also heard very careful, I heard very much during the, during the bond building process that we have a plan for the middle school. It's okay, we don't need to rush it. We as a board expressed some concern about a few items that they had not funded, that the administration had not funded immediately. I think those things are a higher priority than they were. Um, I mean, I'd like to condemn some properties around there and build an auditorium or whatever for the middle school, right? Like, I'm, I'm all for that. But the point is that, just want to be, I, I hear that there are many priorities in this district. I'm aware of that. And what I want to make sure is that we follow through on our commitments on this particular project and we figure out how to do that. And then we'll have another project we'll have to do and another one we'll have to do. So that's all. Yep, anything else? We do encourage people, if they have questions, encourage, yeah. encourage them to contact us. We've got, uh, um, it's, well, I look in town, I know. Yeah, it's, uh, do you encourage people to, to get involved? I think they are, and I think you've been doing a very good job. I'm not yeah, no, no, otherwise. No, it's just, it's re yeah. reiteration. That, 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 you're absolutely right. The, the, yeah. I think we did a good job of sort of getting the schedule conversation under control, and I think all of this would come. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think you did a, a great job, too, but yeah, I, unfortunately, you're inheriting you know, yes. you know, four years of patience yeah. where I've been. So. We'll make it work. Yeah. It's all going to work. No choice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. And we'll, I'm going to, uh, as we move forward, um, I'm going to kind of do a worksheet like this for all the projects. So that we really kind of understand where we're at. We won't show Grant. Yeah. And I'll make sure he understands. This is another conversation. I can just feel Grant crawling under yeah. the table physically. No, this, this is clear to me. Yeah. That's okay. I figured if I can understand it, maybe others could. Makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Good night. Thanks for coming on this way. Uh, yeah, Lisa had asked a request for um, staffing by teacher, by kid size. That's why you got that. Um, lots, of lots of members. Names and others. Um, so I'm happy to try to ask any questions or take any questions. I can find out the answers later. Um, also, maybe lost in this in the numbers. Um, it's a section is the uh, Montclair-Roxbury enrollment data that I think Michelle referenced um, in a previous meeting of what we normally get um, right before budget season, and that was on our budgetary timeline to give out tonight. So um, this is from Grant's office uh, that is similar to what I believe you receive every year. So happy to take questions and attempt to answer them and or get answers for you at a later date. So mine has to do with the fact that since I couldn't figure out who the teachers were, I really don't know how many uh, students each teacher has. Because there are two teachers in last year. Three. Three teachers in last year. So, you know, when you look at this chart, mm -hmm. it doesn't really tell you that. And when I look at that chart, I have the same problem that I had with, uh, this doesn't tell me, for example, is one of those a special educator? No, it was one of those. Like a special educator. Yeah, well, three of those. So, uh, but I'll be able to figure that out as soon as I have, you don't have to answer all that now, just when I get that. So we have a point five special educator here um, who also does point five in intervention services. So mm -hmm. she's a full-time teacher. And we have three classroom teachers in this for it. And while it might not be exact, we have, we have approximately 40 students here. In K. Oh, What's up with the number of unique students? 3,116. Yeah, I was interested in unique, unique sections, number of students, and sections. It looks like that would be a question that I'd have to find out. I'm not sure why it's so unique. <laughs> But I can well, about 3, yeah, I'm not sure why. Well, and it's you, so when you carry it over to the other, that same column is in all of them. 
So it'd be interesting to know mm -hmm. that person. I can find out what that means. Maybe you're saying that I'm, I wasn't, like I was looking at teachers who are on the same team in the middle school that have a different number of students. So just trying to, I'm just trying to understand this. Um, so maybe it depends on what you teach. Well, if you're on the 718, don't you just, if you're a 718, don't you have one team? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So like Mr. Hemke and Mr. Taylor are a 718. Yeah, they're all different. Yeah. But they I have different that. numbers, and I thought they, yeah, of necessity, would have the same number. Not positive on that. I have to ask okay. how that breaks down. This information came from the, like, SIS system, the student identification system, so it might be that it's just classified differently within there for sec data. Um, so that would be my guess around that answer, but I can certainly find out. And these are absolute numbers. They're not like weighted or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't believe that Mr. Taylor could have 140 students. That seems. Well, I could. Do that for a subject? Yeah. For one, that one seven eighteen could be 140 students. I mean, no, there's not 140 students in Taylor, but it may teach that many individual students for like in math. Mm -hmm. Because students from other teams come into that could class. Be. Could be. I'd have to find out. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't even know how to read this. I'm sorry. So if we just look at Union, which is a very simple model, and we just pull up, I don't know these, I don't know their positions, so I don't know what they do or why they do. Yeah. That's what teachers. I was talking yeah. to her in the beginning. It's it okay. helps you to know, I actually could look them up for the high school because they're listed online, but the other right. dates, okay, kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. fourth one down, there's 168 unique students. Yeah, I'm not positive. We're not sure what that number is. Okay, but then there's five sections. That's five sections of kindergartners? No. So what that's referring to is, is this is based on SEC data, I would believe, that we have to report to the state. So that's breaking a, a teacher's day into core classes. Yeah. So she has five core oh, classes. So, you know, okay. ELA would be one, math, science, social study. You know, so it's that's why it says... She doesn't have five sections of kindergartners, but she has, we have to report out in five different areas in kindergarten for sec data and it. how many kids are in there. So, so she has 16 80. students and times five is 80. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that the student number in sections and average student per section. Oh, that explains it yeah. for the others also. Right. Yeah. So they'll have a partial student if they aren't in every single section that that teacher is responsible for. And it doesn't mean she sees 80 students. No, she sees six. Right. This one sees right. 16, right. For, 16 for, but she has to day. teach 16 yeah. times five, basically, exactly. so in yeah. a day or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. so five different courses. So yeah. it's yep. like imagining that she's got five different classes throughout the day in the same 16. Right, but, but what's important, so when you see a partial, it's because in those cases, the, she, there's not the same number of students in every section that that person teaches. Right. Right. So Christina Kane, you know, is a great example of that. So she has 16.6 .6 averages art. Right. right. Uh, she's teach teaching 6, 24 two. different sections. So okay. So yeah. the important thing, if you really want to look at kind of like a workload, is, in the, the, is that last column. If you don't want to count how many different things they're responsible for, then it's right. just that last column. Right? So I feel like something, and I don't know that we have this data. I mean, so please, so, so yeah. Yeah. but something that would obviously influence the workload too is the amount of preps that these teachers have. If we have a teacher who teaches five sections, all the same class, versus another teacher who teaches Well, it's different for high school versus elementary school. Right, so. so if they're prep, that, that prep conversation, conversation applies to middle school. Middle school. school but high school, school yeah. mainly, but. And that's yeah. some of that's contractual? Yes. Yeah. So we kind so of. All of that is contractual. All of it is contractual. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so what, what, is, what is in the contract right now? Depends on Depends the on position. The school. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you will know that very well, as a matter yeah. of fact, <laughs> very soon. Yeah. So I'm curious, for the high school, could you inquire? I noticed that I figured out the high school who does what. And so, for example, special educators have a little less below, and that certainly makes sense. Uh, there are two math teachers with a very low student section load. I'm curious about why. Math. 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 Math.
math class? Yes, I wouldn't have big load either. It's hard. Um, seven kids? What class is it? I don't know. I, it's, it just so happens that the te those teachers that popped up were math teachers, so I don't know what, what classes it is. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for a little more information about that. I'm not saying it's not live, but I'm just saying a little more information about those two. Yeah, we'll have that answer. Yeah. Can we just quickly look at the rough, the enrollment yeah. line chart? I think I understand this one. Yeah, I think I understand. I just wanted to know: Do you know if there have been much? Not in the new year we're adding on, but on the current, on the on the closer in years, have we seen any any significant adjustments in our previous expectations for enrollment on those years? That's a hard question, but for Roxbury, no, for district. So, you know, we were expecting, you know, let's see, last year we were expecting in the 2021 year to be this many students. Now we're realizing actually it's going to be different for 2021. I haven't analyzed it in that way. Okay. I'd have to get these charts from previous it's years. It's okay. And they may not exist exactly like this, but they're close. But um, there's nothing that, ju that you became aware of that was like, holy crap, look what happened there. No. Okay. No, I know that there's bubbles that are going to um, yeah. really influence the middle school that are coming from UBS um, in terms of space and, and they have been too. The availability. And keep in mind that things like the UES numbers, future enrollments are based on birth averages five years ago or, you know, like so, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that that's right. not a real accurate number right. of what is actually, could actually come to kindergarten. So and that's what's driving like the 65s, 68s, 55s that I'm seeing, 20 through 23. That's it's a birth rate. That's a birth rate number. So I was I was looking at this and I'm like, okay, well we'll have this this bubble you're talking about in the middle school, but then we we also have this cliff, you know, we we're, the decrease we're projecting yeah, like a 25 student drop in our kindergarten class between 1920 and 2020. But that's based on birth rate. You okay. don't know but it's going to move into the town. Yeah. These numbers are incorporating our historic um, uh, creep up. Um, we see enrollments, we see people joining in in the middle in addition to birth rate. Mm -hmm. Do we kind of try to deal with that in these too? So I guess we would, right? So we're so what we notice is that the birth rates are pretty pretty good at the first couple of years. You know, they, they're pretty accurate-ish. But then what happens is a few more students come in and a few more students come in as the kids get older. And so those classes grow a little bit over time. Yeah. So, uh, whatever. It's just, a, it's just a rough number to get yeah. us. Yeah, it's not yeah. accurate data points, but it's just something for us to think about. Well, yeah. I think it helps us see in general we're not expecting drops right now. Right, and I was saying we've been growing, which is so unusual in the state. Right. It's hard to tell or predict that the next house that sells, somebody's going to have five kids or they're not going to have any. Right. So that's. I mean, the trend I think thus far has been uh, doing largely anecdotally, but they're kind of, but the numbers, there are older people moving out and a number of families moving in. And I think part of it is, I think people are attracted to the community you have to offer these schools being mm -hmm. part of it. And the more we can sell our story, the better. About how fantastic we are, the better off we'll be. Yeah. We also don't know an influence about the merger with Hawkesbury. Um, we have anecdotal uh, stories of more realtors paying more attention down here. So we don't know that influence yet. And then we also don't know if we're going to see an increase in the speed of grandparenting, of, of dropping off the grandparenting in some way. Right. So we could see some of those numbers come a little early. They sure. won't come late. Yeah. They could come yeah. a little early. Yeah. Still will end up in the same spot. It's a lot of kids at the middle school. Yes. Uh, we can condemn some property and put that some new space. Yeah. <laughs> this is a <laughs> conversation. It's been some of the other people. spreading that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's now. <laughs> and I just have to throw in, sad as it might be, if you are a senior citizen, in your house you've lived in for 30 years in Montpelier, perhaps you can't afford to live there. Thank yeah. God we have income sensitization, sensitizing in our tax code, so we don't have to worry about that too much. Hmm. Oh, okay. Unless you're talking about the municipal side. No, no, no. Because the municipal side is not the income sensitization.
which isn't really what we're in the studio with. Policy readings. Change of music. Board expectations and continued eternal gratitude to Ryan for wrestling with this. I think it's <laughs> eternal gratitude for eternal wrestling. Yes. Um, I did. I did notice. I have to just comment about this. That Ryan from oh. Roxbury is on three heavy duty committees. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. Is he not awesome? Is he is awesome? <laughs> but, uh, I wanted to. Um, <laughs> oh, we have to go to now. In my. Um, Quest to move on. I skipped over my charge. charge. Oh, yeah, that's here. Oh. Uh, yeah. We switched that. Uh, we switched that because uh, it's what was prepared to go. I missed the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. 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 on that right. circular discussion. Yeah. We began this writing this chart from the charge we had from before, mm -hmm. which spoke about a three year. Right. So we thought we'd bring it to you to say, yeah, again, where are we? And um, we obviously can't review something that's not there or that you don't want. How about we change it to review any relevant district plan? Any, any relevant multi year yeah. district plan? Yes. There's plenty of those kicking around, so. so do, do, yeah, or do we just oh, do we just eliminate it? I mean, mm -hmm. what? Well, I think if, I guess it would give us kind of the freedom to, as a finance committee, to be able to take a broad look at the district and say, hey, according to this, we're kind of doing okay, but maybe according to this, we're not. And um, I think that gives you the discretion without. Yeah. 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 Or right right now. Yeah. And as this board already knows, I'll always be talking about the three-year plan that we don't have. <laughs> so then that gets into that number seven, yeah, which, mm -hmm. you know, it says develop and execute a protocol to budget for board priorities outlined in the three-year plan. Yes. We could Just eliminate the outline in the three-year yeah. plan. Yeah. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, we have never decided or we are not doing a three-year plan. Was that the first thing that happened? We well, I mean, we talked about it at length at the retreat way. and didn't I don't think we decide to, so to do it. There is not because it was never resolved. Yeah. Right. We didn't put it in any policy that we worked on at the retreat. Okay. So we have asked for it in the past. We just can't. In past generations of the district. Mm -hmm. Well, it was actually in the policy for Mount Hood for right. years, and we never. Yeah. Which we still didn't have, but. Right. So then, if it doesn't exist, what is the plan that? this committee would reference beyond past budgets mm -hmm. and the CIP maybe. I have no idea so that's why I wish we had a three year plan. Well, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> the capital plan. Yeah, yeah, let me ask, the capital plan. Before we get too stuck in the plan, <laughs> on this bullet point number seven, develop and execute a protocol to budget for board priorities outlined in the three year plan. The first part of the statement, the executed protocol to budget for board priorities, 
I am really inclined to feel like that is the budget policy that we passed at our last meeting. Um, in all the iterations of discussions about budget processing and the budget protocol, I could be wrong with the way I interpret the budget policy that we passed. That kind of was the protocol that we expected to follow for the budget process. Um, so if we're not clear on the plan and our budget policy itself essentially would recreate or does serve the purpose of protocol to budget for board priorities, can we just scratch number seven? Because the protocol is in the, the yeah, other policy. It's policy. in the other policy. Yeah. Right. And likewise, Should when it says to yeah. ensure um, I think that a budget sense. process, the second part of this, I would say, is when we had a little bit of discussion about this over the email, this last part mm -hmm. is really in the budget. Yep. Should, it, should this mm -hmm. charge reference the budget policy then? Probably we would, what would we say? Well, we certainly should refer to the but We did yeah. take out, mm -hmm. Ron and I were having this discussion, and since it happened a while ago, we passed a fiscal management policy, EO1, a budget execution policy, EO2, and then along with that, this one. We did it so long ago, I had to go back and look because I couldn't remember. I just wanted to. So, so here's my concern. Just from like a state government perspective of like seeing a bunch of SOPs sit on the shelf. You know, right now we have all these different policies that have been developed because this group has a lot of energy for it right now. There's, there's a new board. Thinking like 10 to 15 years from now, none of us might be on the board anymore. And somebody's like, somebody's, somebody's, somebody's looking at the finance committee charge. They're like, yeah, we'll put this together. Nobody's referencing these policies. These policies, are, these policies need to be rewritten in about a three-year cycle, so yeah. they, be, they are constantly reviewed. Yeah. And, okay. the, and the exciting thing right. about this new board is this will be the first board I've ever had any contact with where everyone on the board has read every policy because I just read them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, I am concerned about the last number three because I did not understand that the finance committee would be responsible for recommending a budget. I think that's the superintendent's job. It is a big question. It is a big question. Well, I was just but I, surmising I mean, I that, that, that we were going to cut one, the bottom from that bottom part. Okay. Wait. What was your what was recommendation? All three. I, I think we cut all three too. I agree. I think it should be the superintendent that recommends the, the process. Well, we adopted the process. We adopted the process. Okay. Yeah. So is this charge necessary? Well, we need a charge. I think we need a charge. I think one through six makes mm -hmm. sense. I think we can get rid of or one the, through five. Uh, or yeah. six is rewritten. Yeah. Six yeah. is rewritten. Six and seven yeah. reflect on the content of the budget. Whereas one through five are more of the process or the, um, the structure by which you will decide on a budget cost. But the six and seven is when, the, when this committee would turn inward and say, do these reflect our priorities? What should actually be in the budget? So I think there's a big break between five and six, in other words. One through five seem uncontroversial. They're just good government. And then at six, it starts to see, now this group's going to actually tell you what's going to go in the budget at this point. But I, I, don't know if we, I don't know if we want that group to do it. I think we, we want that group to be kind of reviewing the numbers, to make sure yeah. that, yeah. that we yeah. have all the resources in one spot. I mean, the board has a significant fiscal oversight yeah, obligation for the district. And I, I feel like I understood the Finance Committee to be del we're delegating a piece of that yeah. to a smaller number of people to be conducting some degree of fiscal oversight, some yeah. of looking more carefully at the numbers right. and assessing, you know, and kind of has and a, a bit of a wash out to come back and say, well, you know, we've looked at the numbers and here are some concerns rather than, you know, kind of a truthing to make sure that kind of on that line by line thing that the information the board is getting to make big budgetary decisions are real that, yeah. that they they've dealt down and they're seeing good numbers and this is you know so that kind of like 
higher level presentation that we've gotten in the past, we've got people on the board who delve into those enough to tell the board yeah. these, you know, you can trust these or not. But I think the decision making and should stay at the board level. But the charge of this committee is to make sure that that members of the committee have a confidence in those numbers or a lack of confidence in those numbers right. that they can express out to the board and the board can make a better decision based on that. I think Andrew's question is a good one and this is a good discussion which we talked about before which was why why do we have planning? First of all, we never had one. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it was there in a sort of tricky position. And right. so now we're sort of saying, what is it you want? So this discussion is great. To right. what do you want the finance committee to do? Mm -hmm. Right, because I, I think, think the, the finance committee to do exactly what Jim just said. Yeah. Right. To be the, the smartest ones on the board around the budgetary decisions mm -hmm. and financial things that have we've made so that anybody can come to people on the finance committee and the finance committee can answer a question yeah. or know right. where to go to get it. Yep. So look again at the numbers one through seven and see what you want them to say that you think says that. Mm -hmm. Ryan wants to say something. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, like, listening to the conversation right now, I think what happened, and I'm not going to criticize Tina, Andrew, or myself, but, you know, we, we, we stole from the past. When we started yeah. drafting the committee charge, we started with the committee charge that we had last fall. And the finance committee that we put together last fall had a very different task than what we're expecting the new committee to be working on into the future. And so I think some of this stuff was relics that we kind of liked and made sense, but we didn't totally feel comfortable giving the axe or wasn't quite sure how to deal with for the future of the new committee. Um, so yes, I think the, the theme overall does need to shift heavily towards the financial oversight role rather than we have kind of our hands in everything. Um, as the new guy, I certainly wasn't going to put a big X through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think one through five. Yeah, it works. It, um, it works very well. One through five is a nice, neat set of tasks that requires quite a bit of digging. Yeah. And also, there's a cool thing there about as a four for the community. We want to make sure we're good with that, but ensure the community has information or has access to information. So well, now, I'm going to be careful with this because we did rewrite this saying, I wanted it very clear when we were writing this, Steve, no. to say it's not the Budgets Committee's responsibility to tell the community about the budget. It is the entire board's yes. responsibility. We'll be glad to, so that's why this is work with the full board yeah. to ensure the community is presented. Yeah, we talked. Tina and I had talked about this a bit, or emailed about it a bit this past week. I mean, I'm, I'm with you, Steve, in that I feel it's really important when you look at this charge to keep the community in mind and keep that communication to the community in mind. But I definitely understand what Tina is saying, which is this is really a responsibility of all of ours. It shouldn't just fall to the yeah. three people on the budget commun committee to make sure that these issues are articulated to the community. But I think that's the working with, because that's yeah. the finance committee's kind of report out so the board is informed and educated about budget and financial matters that the community needs to get up to. So something that's not here that potentially can be here is, is capital needs as, as a piece of the overall financial picture either. I mean, in, in a variety of different ways. For example, I'm not sure really like that the bidding process or bond spending or any of that is captured by what's here and that's a piece of fiscal oversight. I'm not really, I'm not really sure one way or the other whether it should be, but I just wanted that and then fiscal needs in terms of capital needs are a, another area where there could be some oversight by a committee. Does At least related think? to the bond. The bond yeah, I mean the bond is a whole area where we spend all this money and I don't think well, it's in the budgets or the financials necessarily. And it's murky to the public too. Wait, yeah. why, would, why would it not be in the financials? Debt service is in the financials. Well, the debt service would be in there, but the bond know. repayment would be. It depends on right. what level of detail you're looking for. But the, the spend down of the bond. Right. Is the liability yeah. asset sheet wouldn't necessarily be part of that typically, but it would be the income and expense piece. So you could add that in. You know. Would that be a charge for the finance committee? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, or would it's that just another area where we spend money. Policy? Yeah, I don't know. You know have bidding processes and our committee. It's probably not a real active duty 
right? Because what you're going to do is during a bonding period, you're going to or the, a bond cycle where you're really looking at the bond. That's when it might become active. But then, you know, what's it? But then once it's in place, it's just debt service, and so there's nothing you can do about it at all. Decisions have been made. There's no monitoring to do other than to make sure it's getting paid. But um, I mean, during the period of, of using the bond, you know, in the next couple of years, for instance. But I don't know. There's not a lot of board action, is what I'm saying at those points. For those monies. are you thinking when the district would go out to bond that the finance committee would be involved, or is it more monitoring? That's a really technical process. Yeah, that's. No, that's a but it does matter for things like you know when we made the decision this last time about bonding, we had to dis we had to look at the interaction of as it relates to taxpayer responsibilities between our operating budget and our bonding, and like what what is realistic in this particular year. And they, they definitely wrap right up together. And, and actually, I thought that's where you're going. That's oh, another go really ahead. good point. And another place uh, what is like how the, the confidence in the, in the um, estimates that under, oh, God, underlie yeah. the bond. Right, before you go to bond. Which is just what we were basically just talking about. If you don't have confidence in the numbers that you're using to build your bond proposal, then you end up in these discussions about how do we finish a project. So ju I'm just trying to flesh this out a little bit. So because I, I don't know how, how involved the board should be, so I'm just pulling this out. But it sounds like, is there a point in that process that you think the board should be involved or this committee should be involved with reviewing the district's actions? Well, it we may be total hindsight. I don't know. But I, I'm thinking that it might have been helpful had we had a finance committee at the time that we were debating the bond that was sitting down and getting a sense of where those numbers came from for the project estimates. If it was deeper, I can just, deeper And I think the that, administration I, well, I was know. looking for that. I mean, I think they welcomed that during the development of the bond, right? It's, it, there's a point after which you're just like, okay, now just let us do our work. But there's a lot of confidence building going up to that point, and then because it's all prepping to go to a vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like just like a, an annual budget right. goes to a vote, you have to build confidence along the way. Yeah, because I think in those conversations in this last bond cycle, we were throwing around random numbers. You know, three million, five million. Like, what would this? What would that? And that would be a position where the finance committee could say, well, three million will look like something like this, or five million might look like something like that, to have a better picture of for how. Well, no, I mean, do we need a committee to do that? Because that's going to be like Andrew talking to to contractors about right. projects, right? Or is that our responsibility to get you those kind of like? Would that be the details the of Andrew's what is getting that detail so as in a presentation format rather than the members of the board? I mean, I think it's kind of a perspective mm -hmm. expenditure that's not. That seems to me a little different than kind of like people who sit down and get a handle of what the books look like. So, so I guess I'm still getting. Yeah. Well, I'm just sort of getting at this oversight idea, and not personalizing it. Not it's not about what a great job Andrew is doing, yes. what a great job Libby is doing. It's about what structure does the board have in place to provide some oversight that when we go to the public and say we need five million dollars, and that five million dollars that we spend is going to build these seven things, what is enough oversight? Is it enough that we've just said it's been presented to us by the administration and they've said that? Or is there a, is there a role there for saying that's a place where we should put a board committee on to, and may, maybe it's an ad hoc committee at the time, to dig in a little bit deeper into the confidence in the in the estimates. But don't these five actually reflect more on a monitoring of an existing budget? They do. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's, what, that's where the discussion came from. Right. Sure. right. But that's, that's different than the prospective. Like if you think about both right. Libby's and uh, Bridget's comments about the, the administrative role versus the board, I think in, a, in monitoring, we're asking the board to become smarter so they can do a better job monitoring. But in a building a budget or building a bond, we effectively rely on the experts, the, the professionals, to build it, to have good numbers, come in with good estimates. 
and we don't second we don't have any we don't want to do that we don't want to get involved to the level of second guessing the quality of the estimates effectively you know what's it going to cost to hire one more position in you know arc or whatever we don't want to get in there and figure that out same thing we don't want to figure out how much it's going to cost to build a playground structure so for number three it says report at least quarterly to the montpelier roxbury board of commissioners to ensure transparency and comprehensive discussions of financial matters by the full board so i know that's a broad statement but i would say i think if this works that you could say if you had a concern at this particular point about something. We wish as a board we could know more about the bond for the playground, or we wish we knew more about what construction. You could ask the finance committee to investigate, so, investigate that. Yeah. And that would be uh, not a continual thing. It might just be something that came up. Would you, that, that, would you do that with this, with like, for instance, where we see that the bond that the, the pre-bond estimates were off. We ended up getting bids. We found out that we're way short. We understand that we want to take some action to put some things back in, but we got to find new money for that. Send that to finance committee to work with the administration. Is that a role for that? Is yes. that when you would do that? No. I, Can, I, don't know. No. I think there's an easy fix to this. Oh, good. Good. Why don't we just add six? Other financial matters charged to the committee by the board. It just needs so to be if a we've got a big bond, that's we <laughs> say we want the financial committee to sit okay. and watch this. Review, we say, review, review. Yeah. The financial matters <laughs> at the board's request. At the board's <laughs> request, yeah. yeah. Let's just say with a one through five. Okay, good. That's a good point. Right. Jim, this okay. is why you're the chief. <laughs> Tita, Andrew, Libby, I think you guys saw some, th there's a one email response from Grant on some of this, What's I that? believe. Oh. So we've changed, we're essentially going with one through six with a change to number six now. One through five. Um, didn't we just say we're including six again, but we're changing it to the... No, yeah. we're changing no. Well, right. 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 I'm sure, yes. yes. Okay, we're comfortable that Grant is gonna be happy with the, what's coming across here? Okay. That's why I had the impression I had, but I wasn't, okay. Yes. okay. We'd like the grant to be happy, so we want to make sure. Do we want to approve this now, or do we want to have someone type this up and... Uh, Was it warned for approval? Oh, right, no, it's a, I'm oh, sorry, I'm in policy. It's a committee right? charge. <laughs> you want the other change? Oh, boy. Yes, they're, they're business quite, manager? Yeah, changing CFO to business manager, taking out the hyphens, removing everything after five and inserting the new six, which is review other financial matters at the board's request. Yep. I think this I think could we come back it. in nice, which brings me to a point. This could be come back in nice form for the next board meeting. Okay? Even if it's not approved, you'd have it. Which leads me to something that's going to make the big greater teeth again, which is... We're, we're, we're getting past teeth green thoughts. <laughs> Well, it is thinking uh, which room I can pull up and sleep in tonight. <laughs> this is a quickie. Um, when Ryan and I were talking today, and we were thinking about the last fiscal management policy and the last whatever policy, and I went back to look in my notes, which I have lots of, I have lots of policies that I wrote all over, right? So it, would there be a time in which I could have a copy of all of the um, approved policies. You think we should do paper policies even though they're, they're online? All, all approved policies are online on the board page. Um, I also believe I have shared with all of you, and if I haven't, I've shared it with some of you, a Google Drive of all the policies. So I'm, I'm the, well, the only hesitation I have from our point of view is I do love to have it in front of me in some form, whether it's electronic or some other form, if we're going to talk about it. So it's OK with me if that's where it is. But then you can't bring it up and say, remember policy X and expect me at the time to see. You know what I'm saying? I agree. Right. I agree. Right. So it was just a discussion regarding you know, how we access things in our discussions and deliberations. and. It is. I brought the manual with me tonight because I knew that the budget execution, the financial, was all going to relate back to this finance committee charge. And you know, I think, I guess the discussion Tina had a while ago was just simply, you know, I am totally happy going paperless 
as long as I have something that I can access to actually discuss about tonight at our, at our meetings. Um, I know the Northfield School District, before they had merged, had gone and they had purchased iPads for all the board members. So that was their avenue to ensure that, yes, even though things are on the website, during a meeting, things can still be accessed by everybody. Um, not proposing right now that we budget for <laughs> a full slate. We could just make 10 copies of the policies, but instead of us taking them home, like come to the meeting. You know, it's like you, you have it there. And you get it back in. We always have it. Uh, literally about ready to leave the building. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, policy readings. Uh, um, Did we resolve that? No. 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 It's important to me, too. I don't think there was anything. Okay. It's just discussion. I mean, there wasn't anything to take action on. Or not taking no, no. action on yeah. paper that isn't in our current packet. Yeah. Are there, at the high school, do they have tablets that can be used in like all the They're carefully. No, that's a They're on guard at all times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know some people, though, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I think I would like to say I don't think the discussion's done, but I think we could think of it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, I, that's think of ways to to handle this, and it might be just having common packets that the board can access in meetings. Um, okay. Yeah, because I, I I do agree it's important, but I also um, think we can think about it and probably come to a relatively the least bureaucratic way to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Policy readings, and let's try to be hasty. Well, one of the hasty ones can be that we don't have the superintendent okay. expectation in the packet, so I'm assuming we're not looking at it tonight. We went back, Heather and I went back in the minutes today, because Heather caught it um, this afternoon, that it wasn't in the packet, and in the minutes it said that Steve was going to make some revisions to it. I think that's yes. true. That's true. And uh, so I think it was Steve. No, okay. So, so we missed, Heather and I missed yeah. catching up with Steve on that, so that's right. our bad. Um, yes, but that's we, it's done. That's why. Right. Your bad turned to be a good. Okay. I have one question about the is the time for questions? Yeah, that's right. On the second page, under C1 F, I'm just going to read this to you and tell me what this is. Honor the time allocated on the agenda for long board meetings should be avoided. Mm -hmm. And I want it. Yep. <laughs> Now I know your intent, but what does this say? Yeah, I mean, it's been there the whole time. I know yeah. it has. <laughs> I just meant no. the way it reads, not the intent. Yeah, this would have been the discussions we had in the very first reading a year ago. It was really the intention is we do our best practice to, how should we say? Stick to the agenda. Talk. Yes, and. My only question right. was, does it say that? Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it's, it's it doesn't really make sense. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see it until now. I don't know how to get on the agenda. It's C1. I mean, I absolutely agree with it. I'm just saying, despite tonight. Well, it actually. Why are the time allocated on the agenda? Well, it seems like as if the time allocated on the agenda for it's one week. For one week. I thought it should be one week. I'm curious than, than an at long board meeting. Let's get rid of the word for. Just make it two statements. We're getting rid of it. It's out of the time allocated on the agenda. Okay. Period. Period. Yep. I like it. And then we could do another one. Long before <laughs> feeding it should be able to get it. I'm not going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan, for your work on this. Two statements? Wait, what are we doing there, really? I think it's not in the time allocated on the agenda. And delete the rest. And delete the rest, because it's yeah. not. In fact, if anything, it implies that if there's time allocated on the agenda for long meetings, <laughs> you should honor it. You, know, you should avoid it. Right. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, you're telling me that you did. Okay. Sorry about that. Good. Somehow this is missing. 
No, it's, it was, um, yep. it looked like there was some editing that got half done. Mm -hmm. And then got read 16,000 times. I didn't say Got ignored and, yeah. Yeah, if you wanted to live in it, but really. Yeah, I was going to say, they're really going to do things. Yeah, I was going to say, they're really going to do things. Are we approving this policy finish? Wow. Yeah. There. It has to come back for the final. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the only editor I see. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you, Brian, again. It's a whole thing with the designer, and it's easy to end this time, right? Because it didn't change the substance of anything. Yeah. Right. Well, actually, then, could could the superintendent's expectations policy come back next time also? Because no. unless you change something, unless you would come No, there was going to be a change, and I'm blanking on what it was. But. I remember I had written down what you were talking about, but if you decide that the change wasn't necessary, then technically the super, superintendent expectations I see your point. Okay. Well, why don't we, you and I will review that and see, and then we'll hopefully bring it back without a change. I think there's something very much. I think the meetings you and I asked the same exact question. And amusingly, you had responded <laughs> to me the first time. So. <laughs> Sometimes I just need to be oppositional, too. Oh, okay. oh really? <laughs> None of us do that about the seats. <laughs> oh. If there's not going to be a change and we're going to adopt it next time, I need to know by Friday. Okay, Saturday. Okay. 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 Ryan, we'll on tomorrow, and then we'll review it, and then we'll let you know this week. Okay. okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Move, we adjourn. I second that. Uh, second. <laughs> Third. All those in favor. All right. <laughs>